Hello, my name is Dr. Leon Creedy. I'm a consultant in sport and exercise medicine based in Manchester, UK. And today I wanted to talk to you about meniscal injuries in the knee. These are some of the things that I wanted to cover today. So the menisci are very important. Um, the main concept to understand here is that uh, they convert axial compression between the tibia and the femur to hoop stress, thus alleviating the articular cartilage in the knee joint itself. Um, the lateral meniscus uh, distributes more load than the medial meniscus, so when the lateral meniscus is, is injured, it is more devastating to the knee, uh, potentially. How do we examine for meniscal tears? Well, we have various clinical tests that we use. Joint line tenderness and an effusion, we can see is poorly sensitive and specific. Um, McMurray's test by itself, um, not many knees um, have a positive McMurray's test, but it is quite a specific test. Um, Apley's, Thessaly's test uh, don't uh, compare that favorably. Um, but when you uh, combine them, that's when you get good sensitivity and specificity. And you can see uh, that clinical testing there um, approaches that of MRI, uh, which is almost uh, considered uh, infallible, although meniscal tears can be missed on MRI. What do the menisci look like on an MRI scan? Uh, sequence A here is a T1 image uh, in the coronal section of uh, the menisci on either side. Section B, we're looking at the medial compartment there, sagittally, uh, the anterior and the posterior horns of the medial meniscus. Um, and section uh, C there, we're looking uh, again at a sagittal view of the anterior and posterior horns of the lateral meniscus. Um, this is just a cartoon um, of the menisci uh, to differentiate for you between these concepts of the red and white zone. We'll go into that further. But the red zone is the well vascularized portion of the meniscus which has better chance of healing. Uh, compared to the relatively avascular central white portion which because it has a poorer blood supply has poorer capacity to heal and regenerate. We do give different types of meniscal tears uh, anatomical names, a radial tear, one uh, beginning at the centre and radiating outwards uh, whereas a longitudinal tear is running around the circumference um, and the horizontal tears which are degenerative in nature uh, which are proceeding uh, horizontally, uh, usually starting as an intrasubstance tear, uh, not always reaching an articular surface. This is what a meniscus looks in, uh, like in real life, um, and you can see the different morphology between the uh, medial and lateral menisci. If you look at a cross section of a meniscus, you can see that uh, the collagen fibers are running in a circumferential direction. So when you tear parallel to the um, collagen fibers, uh, you don't lose that hoop stress effect so much as when you cut uh, tangen tangentially uh, across the collagen, uh, when obviously you're detensioning uh, the meniscus and defunctioning it. So coming back to that blood supply issue, you can see a microscopic section uh, going through a meniscus there and you can see the capillaries on the periphery, the uh, red zone of the meniscus uh, and they peter out to the white zone. So we talk about pure red tears, white tears or red on white tears uh, if it's crossing between the two areas. And then we can see on the uh, right picture there a fairly degenerative looking uh, posterior horn uh, of the meniscus with intrasubstance uh, high signal uh, extending to the uh, tibial 
articular surface there. So the MRI features of a meniscal tear. Um, the important section there is highlighted in red. Uh, we must have high signal extending in a line or band to one of the articular surfaces, either the superior tibial articular surface or the inferior, um, sorry, the superior uh, femoral surface or the inferior uh, tibial surface, or indeed both. If the high signal uh, remains entirely within the substance of the meniscus, uh, we simply refer to this as mucoid degeneration. Uh, we also have on MRIs this uh, concept of the two slice touch rule. So we need to see it on uh, two contiguous uh, slices on the MRI scan to call it a definite tear. If we only see it on one uh, slice, you're far likely to be able to visualize a tear when you perform an arthroscopy. Uh, and these are labeled uh, as possible tears by radiologists. Um, this is how the different tears appear on MRI. Here we have an example of a longitudinal tear. Here's your bucket handle tear. These are the ones that cause the knees to lock. Uh, we can see um, prolapsed meniscal tissue in um, picture B there. That's prolapsed into the centre of the joint. And we can also see the double PCL sign there in section D. Um, and we can also see in section F there again, prolapsed meniscal tissue lying uh, between the femoral condyles in the centre of the joint. These are the degenerative tears, these horizontal cleavage tears. Uh, they often uh, start off as uh, intrasubstance uh, signal change and then eventually do reach an articular surface. These are uh, considered atraumatic in nature and degenerative and usually seen in people over the age of 40. Um, radial tears, uh, these are certainly the worst ones to have uh, in terms of defunctioning the meniscus because you're cutting across the lines of collagen uh, and reducing uh, that hoop stress and obviously they're also in the white zone so they're not only being pulled apart by the, by the biomechanical forces but uh, they also have a poor blood supply and as we'll see later don't heal very well. Meniscal tears and degeneration both uh, rise with age uh, and can be considered normal findings um, in uh, people of increasingly um, uh, older age. So in the past, um, all knee pain with a meniscal tear uh, was operated on. The culture has changed now and it's really questionable what the benefit of partial meniscectomy is particularly in degenerative tears. So we now have the quandary with patients of do we operate or not? I wanna try and ask uh, and answer uh, some of these questions in the following slides. Um, what is the risk of developing osteoarthritis following a meniscal tear with or without a partial meniscectomy or when left alone? What is the likelihood of a meniscal tear if you treat it conservatively, healing or becoming asymptomatic? Um, and what are the chances of you lead uh, a meniscal tear alone? Is there of it going on to need surgery? So we do believe that meniscal tears are part of the uh, pathogenesis of osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, if you lose that hoop stress and that protective effect on the articular cartilage, we get increased biomechanical stress on the articular cartilage, which eventually wears down to bone and once you get those subchondral bone changes uh, you start to develop pain which the patient experiences as osteoarthritis by then they will have x-ray changes so going on to try and answer some of these questions um, does meniscectomy increase the risk of uh, going on to develop osteoarthritis this was looked at in this study and the answer is, uh, seems to be yes. We have um, the black circles there, the operated knees. These are people with meniscal tears who have limited meniscectomy uh, and the uh, comparison knees, uh, the white circles there. And we can see 
higher uh, rates of change for radiographic, radiographic osteoarthritis in the operated knees. A similar study asking uh, the same question, again similar uh, conclusions, um, but this one focused on uh, what's the natural history of meniscal tears that aren't operated on. And again, we can see that there is that increased risk. Meniscal damage at baseline more common in case knees than control knees. So although we know that arthroscopic partial meniscectomy uh, does have uh, an association with increased OA, so does uh, a meniscal tear that is left untreated. So one of the uh, questions that we want to ask is if we leave a meniscal tear alone, uh, what might happen to it and this does seem to depend a lot on what kind of meniscal tear that you have. This was a retrospective study uh, looking at patients who were having um, ACL reconstructions and they looked at the state of the uh, menisci at the same time uh, and what they discovered is that those who have those longitudinal or circumferential tears they often have a good chance of healing but the radial tears uh, almost never heal. Uh, and I understand, unders I explained to you uh, the uh, biomechanics and the vascular supply in relation to ra radial tears, which would make that conclusion uh, apparent. Uh, in another study, um, they compared the uh, medial and lateral compartments, um, and they again could see that there was a superior uh, healing rate in the lateral compartment compared to the medial compartment. Final study here, really backing up the results of the previous one, again showing that lateral meniscus has a better tendency to heal than the medial meniscus. And this was um, with only three months uh, follow-up, so quite quick healing in fact. So, uh, in summary, the medial meniscus um, has capacity to heal. Um, you can confidently expect at least half of them to heal over a three-month period. Uh, significantly better chances in the lateral meniscus. In terms of the morphology of the injury, uh, you'd want to have a, a longitudinal tear in the peripheral red zone. You definitely wouldn't want to have a radial tear. And we conclude that stable longitudinal tears, which tend to occur in the peripheral vascular portions of the menisci, have great potential for healing. So we move on to some trials here, which compared surgery versus physiotherapy uh, for people with a meniscal tear and concurrent osteoarthritis. Um, to see uh, what uh, kind of comparison do we get uh, down the line. These patients were uh, looked at with the WOMAC score um, at six months and we can see uh, that there was a 20 uh, point uh, improvement in the surgical group compared to 18.5 in the physical therapy group which is a difference of 2.4 points which is not considered significant. Therefore for most patients uh, physiotherapy is a reasonable first course. What we do note from this study obviously is that uh, at six months of those initially treated with physiotherapy 30% uh, went on to have surgery. So what we can expect when we treat our patients with meniscal tears conservatively is that most will have a out good outcome but about 30% uh, are going to cross over and have surgery. That still means 70% uh, can probably be managed uh, conservatively. Some people do ask, uh, can you predict uh, which patients will do well in terms of the morphology of uh, the meniscal tear itself? Um, what this study showed is that it doesn't seem to matter what the type of meniscal tear is in terms of patient satisfaction uh, after a significant uh, period of time. This was an interesting study 
um, done in Europe where they uh, treated meniscal uh, pathology conservatively and followed them up with MRI. They did an MRI at the beginning of the year and 12 months later. And what the results show here is that uh, of the 101 patients treated, nearly all uh, uh, have perceived uh, significant or complete improvement after a year. But what's really interesting is um, it seems to make no difference whether the MRI appearances have improved after a year. Uh, if we look at that final total figures there, MRI appearance uh, improved or unchanged. Uh, we see you know, 12 and 35 people improving uh, compared to the MRI appearance actually looked worse, 16 and 22. Um, but despite the MRI looking worse, these patients were still saying that they had either complete recovery or strong improvements. So there's this dichotomy there between the patient's experience at 12 months, them saying that they actually feel better uh, and the pain has gone away, the MRI actually looks worse. So it's a good lesson in not trusting what we see uh, on the imaging, uh, but really going off uh, the clinical assessment. Um, further studies there, just corroborating uh, what we've seen in previous slides. Uh, even higher numbers in this one, lateral and meniscal tears uh, left uh, in situ at the time of ACL reconstruction did not require reoperation at a six year follow up uh, over 90% of the time. This was a really interesting study where they actually did a genuine arthroscopic partial meniscectomy versus sham surgery. Uh, you might ask how uh, they got ethical approval for sham surgery. Essentially what they did in this study is they did diagnostic arthroscopy where they looked inside the knee uh, to make a diagnosis but didn't perform any actual meniscectomy. Then came back out of the joint but told the patient uh, that they'd had a meniscectomy. Really interesting results is that there was almost no difference in pain scores between the two groups. 21.7 uh, in the partial meniscectomy group versus 23.3 in the sham surgery group. It does suggest quite possibly that arthroscopic partial meniscectomy is a placebo procedure in uh, many cases. Getting right up to modern times now, this study published in uh, June uh, 2020 in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. The devil is in the detail here. So we can see uh, with a few trials, particularly in patients without osteoarthritis, the standardised mean, mean difference does show statistically uh, superiority uh, of arthroscopic uh, partial meniscectomy uh, over controls. However, the actual clinical difference in the CU score uh, was around uh, 6 out of 100 with a mini minimally clinically important difference defined as uh, somewhere between 6 and 10. So although statistically uh, with large uh, trials we can detect slight superiority of partial meniscectomy over control, the uh, terms uh, in terms of uh, clinical difference it's really quite small um, therefore the recommended modern strategy for people with meniscal tears is to try physiotherapy for a period of 6 to uh, 12 weeks first uh, and only proceed to very limited partial meniscectomy in cases that fail to improve what about meniscal repair? Well, in young people particularly, we would always rather repair the meniscus uh, than remove it. Uh, we want to maintain that function of the meniscus uh, to prevent a subsequent develop, uh, development of osteoarthritis. These are the criteria that we look at, uh, that a surgeon looks at, uh, when they're deciding whether a meniscal tear is potentially repairable. Uh, we want it to be uh, within the red zone, so less than three millimeters uh, from the edge of the meniscus. Uh, we like it to be a stable flap, not one that's flopping in the breeze. Uh, it's better uh, when it's a new injury, preferably uh, within the previous uh, month rather than an old injury. 
Um, obviously, uh, we prefer it to be uh, in a younger person as well because they have better vascularity and regenerative capacity. The disadvantage of repair, obviously, particularly in professional circles, is that it can take six months uh, to return from meniscal repair surgery, whereas you can come back uh, within six weeks from a partial meniscectomy. So in uh, elite and professional sport, because time is of the essence, uh, the knee in that sense can sometimes be uh, sacrificed for its future health in order to get returned to play sooner. So there was a barrage of literature a few years ago uh, in the major journals uh, saying, uh, you know, we shouldn't uh, be operating now on degenerative meniscal tears. Um, and this does seem to be backed up by the evidence. So what is the alternative treatment? Uh, we suggest an exercise program for the knee, uh, for pain, usually coming from the sign of isis caused by the meniscal tear rather than the aneural uh, meniscus itself. We can give things like steroid injections um, or visco supplementation injections or indeed uh, even platelet-rich plasma these days. Uh, and as I said, only if people uh, fail to improve after three months uh, should arthroscopic partial meniscectomy be considered. So in summary, uh, we should always attempt uh, meniscal repair in young people if possible. That's what's best for their knee, though it does fail. Uh, always attempt uh, conservative treatment in the first instance. Uh, and only resort to arthroscopic partial meniscectomy in cases uh, that fail to pro progress. Um, and we would anticipate 70% uh, of people or perhaps up to 90% of people doing well at 12 months. 70% uh, probably at three months. Um, partial meniscectomy only uh, works uh, well with significant symptoms such as pain, mechanical locking of the joint and painful clicking. However, if you ride it out, um, it tends to improve over time. Uh, many thanks and if you'd like